<sighs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna get into this in a moment. Finally read the damn book, so don't mind me. Pop Quest gets stoned, has a beer, and reads Teeming with Microbes uh, by Jeff Lowenfels and Wayne Lewis. Uh, the Organic Gardener's Guide to the Soil Food Web, Revised Edition. Uh, today we're reading the preface in chapter one. Preface. We were typical suburban gardeners. Each year, at the beginning of the growing season, we carpet bombed our lawns with a mega dose of water soluble, high nitrogen fertilizer and watered like crazy. Then we strafed their weeds with a popular broadleaf herbicide. Next, we attacked our vegetable gardens and flower beds with a bag or two of commercial fertilizer and leveled them with a rototiller until the soil, the color and texture of finely ground coffee, lay as smooth and level as the Bonneville salt flats. These things we did religiously, as did most of our neighbors. Once was never enough either. We continued to use chemical fertilizers throughout the season as if we were competing in the large vegetable contest at the Alaska State Fair. And at the end of the season, we rototilled again, for some inexplicable reason. When necessary, and it often was, we would suit up into protective clothing, complete with rubber gloves and a face mask, and paint our birches to protect them from invading aphids by using some god-awful smelling stuff that listed ingredients no normal person could pronounce. Assuming he or she took the time to read the incredible, incredibly small print on the chemical's label. Then we sprayed our spruce trees with something that smelled even worse. Something so strong, one application lasted not one, but two years. It was a good thing we did protect ourselves, as both spray products are now off the market, withdrawn as health hazards. Don't misunderstand us. At the same time, we were also practicing what we considered to be an appropriate measure of environmental responsibility and political correctness. We left the grass clippings on the lawn to decompose and tilled fallen leaves into the garden beds. And occasionally, we let loose batches of lace wings, ladybird beetles, and praying mantids, our version of integrated pest management. We composted, we recycled our newspapers and aluminum cans. We fed the birds and allowed all manner of wildlife to wander in our yards. In our minds, we were pretty organic and uh, environmentally conscious, if not downright responsible. Oh, hold on a second. Ooh. Yeah, in our minds, we were pretty organic, environmentally conscious, if not downright responsible. In short, we were like most home gardeners, maintaining just the right balance between better living and chemistry, and at least some of Rachel Carson's teachings. Besides, we were mostly using only water-soluble high-nitrogen fertilizer. How bad could that be for the environment? It sure made the plants grow, and we were really enjoyed. Uh, we were really employed only one weed killer, um, albeit a non-selective broadleaf one. 
Okay, we occasionally resorted to an insecticide too, but when we considered what was on the shelves of our favorite nurseries, these didn't amount to much in our minds. Surely we couldn't be causing harm when we were only trying to save a spruce, help a birch, or prevent noxious dandelions and chicken weed from taking over our world. Central to the way we cared for our gardens and yards was a notion shared by tens of millions of other gardeners, and, until you finish this book, perhaps you as well. Nitrogen from an organic source is the same as nitrogen from an inorganic one. Plants really didn't care if their nitrogen and other nutrients came from a blue powder you mix with water or aged manure. It is all nitrogen to them. Then one autumn, after the gardens were put to bed and we were settling in for the winter, looking for something to hold our horticultural interest for the cold months, a gardening friend emailed two stunning electron microscope pictures. The first showed an exquisite detail, a nematode trapped by a single looped fungal strand, or hypha. Wow, this was quite a picture. A fungus taking out a nematode. We had never heard of, much less seen such a thing. And it started us wondering, how did the fungus kill its prey? What attracted the blind nematode to the ring of the fungus in the first place? How do the rings work? The second image showed what appeared to be a similar nematode, only this one was unimpeded by fungal hyphae and had entered the tomato root. This photo raised its own questions. Why wasn't this nematode attacked? And where were the fungal hyphae that killed off the first nematode? Yeah. Oh, this, I, I wish the lights were better because then I could show you this. Yeah. You can always check out the title of the stream to see what's going on. While researching the answers to these questions, we stumbled upon the work of Dr. Elaine Ingham a social microbiologist famous for her work with a life that resides in soil, and, in particular, who eats uh, whom in the soil world. Uh, since some organisms eat from more than one food chain, or are eaten by more than one type of predator, the chains are linked into webs, soil food webs. Ingham, uh, an excellent teacher, became our guide to the whole world of complex communities in the soil. Through her, we learned that the fungus in the first photograph was protecting the plant's roots. If that wasn't enough to make us stop and think, we learned the plant attacked the fungus, attached, uh, sorry, we learned the plant attracted the fungus to its roots in the first instance. And we also learned what killed the fungus that would have prevented the nematode from attacking the tomato root. Naturally, we began to wonder what other uh, heretofore, un, uh, heretofore unseen things were going on down there in the soil. Might the world revealed to us by tools like the electron microscope affect how we care for the plant in our gardens, yards, and lawns? We have all been dazzled by Hubble images of deep space, incomprehensibly far away. Um, yet few of us have ever had the opportunity to marvel at the photographs produced by a scanning electron microscope, which provide a window to an equally unknown universe literally right under our feet. <clears throat> we look for answers and soon realize that while we were out spreading fertilizer and rototilling our garden beds by rope, an ever-growing group of scientists around the world have been making discovery after discovery that put these practices into question. Many scientific disciplines, microbiology, bacteriology, mycology, the study of fungi, um, myrmecology, the study of ants, chemistry, agriculture, came together in recent decades to focus jointly on understanding the world of soil. Slowly, their findings about what goes on in the soil are being applied to commercial agriculture, silviculture, and viniculture, or viniculture, I don't know. It is time we applied this science to things we grow in our home yards and gardens. Oh, yeah. 
All right, so I was just talking about those two photos that were sent, and it shows um, the nematodes here. Um, and oh, sorry, I had uh, tried to read to you and get you to learn or get you to read the title. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, the first photo, it says, a foraging root-eating nematode trapped by fungal hypha. And the other one is the photo um, of the nematode that's entering the, the root um, with no fungal hyphae barring the way a nematode penetrates a tomato root to feed. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Most gardeners are stuck in traditional horticultural land, a place where a blend of old wives' tales, anecdotal evidence, and slick commercial pitches designed to sell products dictates our seasonal activities. If there is any understanding of the underlying science of gardening, it is almost always limited to the soil's NPK chemistry and its physical structure. As you read these pages, you will learn how to use the biology in your soils naturally and manipulated to your and your plants benefit yeah. uh, since chemical fertilizers kill the soil microorganisms and chase away larger animals the systems uh, the system we espouse is an organic one free of chemicals chemicals in fact are what killed off the root protecting fungal hyphae giving our nematode friend access to the unprotected tomato root in the second photo by necessity, this photo is divided into two sections. The first is an explanation of soil and the soil food web. There is no getting around it. You have to know the science before you can apply it. At least in this instance, the science is fascinating, even astonishing, and we try not to make a textbook out of it. The second section is an explanation of how to work the soil food web to your soil's advantage, and to yours as a gardener. What makes this book different from others' text on soil is our strong emphasis on the biology and microbiology of soils, relationships between the soil and, my, and organisms in the soil, and their impact on plants. We are not abandoning soil chemistry, pH, caution exchange, porosity, texture, and other ways to describe soil. Classic soil science is covered but from the premise that is the stage where the biology acts out its many dramas. After the players are introduced and the individual stories told, what evolves is a set of predictable outcomes from their inner relationships, or lack thereof. In the second half of the book, these outcomes are formed into a few simple rules, rules that we've applied into our yards and gardens, as have many of our neighbors in Alaska where we initiated these new practices. So have others, through the Pacific Northwest in particular, but in other parts of the world as well. We think that learning about and then applying soil science, particularly the science of how various forms of life and the soil interrelate, the soil food web, has made us better gardeners. Once you are aware of and appreciate the beautiful synergism between soil organisms you will not only become a better gardener, but a better steward of the earth. Home gardeners really have no business applying poisons, and yet apply them they do to the food they grow and eat, <laughs> and worse, feed to their families and the lawns on which they play. You might be tempted to skip right to the second part of this book, but we strongly discourage doing so. It is essential to know the science to really understand the rules. Sure, it requires a bit of effort, or the chapter on soil science does anyway. But uh, for too long, for too many gardeners, everything we needed to know came in a bottle or jar and all we had to do was mix with water and apply with a hose and sprayer. Instant cooking meets home gardening, some hobby. Well, we want you to be thinking gardeners, not mindless consumers who react because a magazine or television ad says to do something. If you really want to be a good gardener, you need to understand what is going on in your soil. So here goes. 
We now know all nitrogen is not the same and that if you let the plants and the biology and the soil do their jobs, gardening becomes much easier and gardens much better. May your yard and your gardens grow to their natural uh, glory. <laughs> we know uh, ours now do. Oh yeah. Oh boy. Well there it was. That was the preface. Tried to read through it. I hope you were able to to follow. It's in the title. You know, when you look at the stream, you look at my broadcast, there's the title of the broadcast, and uh, I added it. Uh, you can type exclamation point stream, exclamation point uh, title. Yeah, I follow them there. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> He's an awesome dude. chapter one yeah so you know this basically explain this idea um, which is just the norm the layman doesn't really look into these things we don't really understand certain things about gardening that we just go and, and like we, we look at products on the shelf and we're like all right well what kills slugs or hey I need to get rid of weeds or um, what do I need to get uh, more tomatoes and then so they go to the store and they just see a label that's like oh you know this is something that kills slugs this is a fertilizer for tomatoes um, that kind of shit and uh, they don't necessarily look into proper application um, if it is uh, something that is actually right for them um, and they'll proceed to use the product um, to the level that they feel is necessary without understanding the necessary components of it, if you will. Like uh, we talked about uh, the NPK. Uh, you look at fertilizers and it has the NPK on the bag. Um, and uh, that's something that even people just like glance at it and be like, alright, well I've got some levels of this and this bag has some levels of that like, without understanding what it means. Um, we were talking earlier about the folks that do want to do natural gardening, want to do organic gardening, but actually don't get to the level where they take the time to understand what's actually in the soil or measuring what's in the soil, how they're affecting it through applications of composting or their water. They don't know anything about their water source or, or whatnot, you know. Um, wanna, wanna have live soil but don't know what's living there kind of thing. Um, so it does, it does go a great length to actually understand these, these things where they be. Just saying. I worked for an organic lavender farm in Southern California, and um, multiple times we lost our certification as an organic farm because of things where we let people use a field as a parking lot for a festival. We had a third party uh, pesticide company that was treating the uh, facility, the buildings, 
and was improperly spraying um, and their uh, chemicals were leaching into the soil and came up in the um, the test that we were doing to try and maintain our organic certification and failed because um, there was stuff that was being implied applied improperly uh, by folks that are supposed to be doing it right but not taking the time to actually make an effort uh, to do these things like you know um, I always tell people like a anyone could fucking take a supplement read or sorry anyone could take a pesticide uh, mix it together in a in a solution of water and apply it with a sprayer but how many of those people have actually calibrated the sprayer or know that that's a thing you know but that's that's stuff like that where we see the abuse misuse improper applications um, that make it worse than than trying to stick to to natural means or doing it the right way you know Not really. I've never had an instance or read or had anyone else tell me that fruit flies are beneficial for your garden. Yeah. Alright. So we're getting to the nitty gritty now. Alright. I just read the preface for you. Now we start with uh, part one. The basic science. Um, Electron microscope photography of organic compost humus, brown, decaying plant material, green, and some mineral particles, purple and yellow, uh, 25 times magnification um, in that image right here. So the brown is the humus, the green is the organic material, and then there's some like minerals. This is a 25 times magnification uh, picture from an electron microscope. Yeah. <clears throat> Chapter 1. What is the soil food web, and why should gardeners care? Uh, given its vital importance to our hobby, it is amazing that most of us don't venture beyond the understanding that good soil supports plant life and poor soil doesn't. You've undoubtedly seen worms in good soil, and unless you habitually use pesticides, you should have come across other soil life. Centipedes, springtails, ants, slugs, ladybird, beetle larvae, and more. Most of this life is on the surface, in the first four inches, ten centimeters, some soil microbes have even been discovered living comfortably an incredible two miles beneath the surface. Good soil, however, is not just a few animals. Good soil is absolutely teeming with life, yet seldom does the realization that this is so engender a reaction of satisfaction. Yeah. Um, in addition to all the living organisms you can see in garden soils, for example, there are up to 50 earthworms in a square foot, 0 0.09 square meters of good soil. Uh, 50 earthworms in a square foot of good soil, or 0.9 square meters, meters of soil. There is a whole world of soil organisms that you cannot see unless you use sophisticated and expensive optics. Only then do the tiny microscopic organisms, bacteria, fungi, protozoa, nematodes, appear and in numbers that are nothing less than staggering. A mere teaspoon of good garden soil, as measured by, as measured by microbial geneticists, contain a billion invisible bacteria, several yards of equally invisible fungal hyphae, several thousand protozoa, and a few dozen nematodes. The common denominator of all soil life is that every organism needs an energy to survive. 
while a few bacteria known as chemosynthesizers derive energy from sulfur, nitrogen, or even iron compounds, the rest have to eat something containing carbon in order to get the energy they need to sustain life. Carbon may come from organic materials supplied by plants, waste pro products produced by other organisms, or the bodies of other organisms, or, or the bodies of other organisms. The first order of business of all soil life is obtaining carbon to fuel metabolism. It is an eat and be eaten world in and on soil. Do you remember the children's song about an old lady who accidentally swallowed a fly? She then swallows a spider that wriggled and jiggled and tickled inside her to catch the fly, and then a bird to catch the spider, and so on until she eats a horse and dies. Of course. If you made a diagram of who is expected to eat whom, starting with the fly and ending with the improbable horse, you would have what is known as a food chain. Most organisms eat more than one kind of prey, so if you make a diagram of who eats whom in and on the soil, the straight line food chain instead becomes a series of food chains linked and cross-linked to each other, creating web of food chains, or a soil food web. Each soil environment has a different set of organisms, and thus a different soil food web. This is the simple graphical definition of a soil food web. Though, as you can imagine, this and other diagrams represent complex and highly organized sets of interactions, relationships, and chemical and physical processes. The story each tells, however, is a simple one and always starts with a plant. Yeah. yeah. I would tensogen for sure. Um, here we like to stick with facts and science, um, in which, if you want to follow ideas versus fact and science, um, you should go elsewhere. Sit back, listen to us reading, um, and go with it. Now is not the time for questions. Um, if fruit flies were beneficial, um, we wouldn't set up traps and there wouldn't be um, government officials enacting these fly traps being set for fruit flies. <clears throat> Most gardeners think uh, of plants as only taking up nutrients through root system and feeding the leaves. Do you realize that a great deal of the energy that results from photosynthesis in the leaves is actually used by plants to produce chemicals they secrete through their roots? These secretions are known as exudates. Exudates. A good analogy is perspiration, a human exudate. Yeah. Root exudates are in the form of carbohydrates, including sugars and proteins. Amazingly, their presence wakes up, attracts, and grows specific beneficial bacteria and fungi living in the soil that subsists on these exudates, and the cellular material uh, shallowed off the plant, uh, the plant's root tips grow. Uh, sorry, let me reread that. Um, Amazingly, their presence wakes up, attracts, and grows specific beneficial bacteria and fungi living in the soil that subsists on these exudates, and the cellular material uh, sloughed off as the plant's root tips grow. All this section of exudates and slowing off the cells uh, takes place in the rhizosphere, a zone immediately around the roots, extending out about a tenth of an inch, or a couple of millimeters. One millimeter is equal to one twenty-fifth of an inch. The rhizosphere, which can look like a jelly or jam under the electron microscope, contains a constantly changing mix of soil organisms, including bacteria, fungi, nematodes, protozoa, and even larger organisms. All this life competes for the exudates of the rhizosphere, or its water or mineral content. At the bottom of the soil food web are bacteria and fungi, which are attracted to and consume plant root exudates. 
In turn, they attract and are eaten by bigger microbes, specifically nematodes and protozoa. Remember the amoeba, uh, paramecia, flagellates, and ciliates you should have studied in biology? Yep. Um, who eat bacteria and fungi, primarily for carbon, to fuel their meta uh, metabolic func uh, metabolic functions? Um, anything they don't need is excreted in waste, which plant roots are readily able to absorb as nutrients. How convenient that this production of plant nutrients take place right in the rhizosphere, the site of root nutrient absorption. At the center of any viable soil food web are plants. Plants control the food web for their own benefit, an amazing fact that is too little understood and surely not appreciated by gardeners who are constantly interfering with nature's system. Studies indicate that individual plants contro can control the numbers and the different kinds of fungi and bacteria attracted to the rhizosphere um, by the exudates they produce. Oh, oh, that's cool. During different times of growing season, uh, populations of rhizosphere, bacteria, and fungi wax and wane, depending on the nutrient needs of the plant and the exudates it produces. Soil bacteria and fungi are like small bags of fertilizer, retaining in their bodies nitrogen and other nutrients they gain from root exudates and other organic matter, such as those sloughed off root tip cells. Um, carrying on the analogy, Soil protozoa and nematodes act like fertilizer spreaders by releasing the nutrients locked up in the bacteria and fungi fertilizer bags. The nematodes and protozoas in the soil come along and eat the bacteria and fungi in the rhizosphere. They digest what they need to survive and excrete excess carbon and other nutrients as waste. Left to their own devices, then Plants produce exudates that attract fungi and bacteria, and ultimately nematodes and protozoa. Uh, yes, that's that's how it's uh, pronounced. Yeah, um, their or sorry, that's how it's spelled. Uh, their survival depends on the interplay between these microbes. It is completely a natural. It is a completely natural system, the very same one that has fueled plants since they evolved. Uh, soil life provides the nutrients needed for plant life, and plants initiate and fuel the cycle by producing exudates. Soil life creates soil structure. The protozoa and nematodes that feasted on the fungi and bacteria attracted by plant exudates are in turn eaten by arthropods, animals with segmented bodies, jointed appendages, and hard outer coverings called an exoskeleton. Insects, spiders, even shrimp and lobsters are arthropods. Soil arthropods eat each other and themselves are the, oh, sorry. Soil arthropods eat each other and themselves are the food of snakes, birds, moles, and other animals. Simply put, the soil is one big fast food chain. In the course of all this eating, members of a soil food web move about in search of prey or protection, and while they do, they have an impact on the soil. Bacteria are so small, they need to stick to the things, uh, stick to things, or they will wash away. Uh, to attach themselves, they produce a slime, the secondary result of which is that individual soil particles are bound together. Uh, if the concept is hard to grasp, think of the plaque produced overnight in your mouth, which enables mouth bacteria to stick to your teeth. Fungal hyphae, too, travel through soil particles, sticking to them and binding them together, uh, thread-like, into aggregates. Worms, uh, together with insect larvae and moles and other burrowing animals, move through the soil in search of food and protection creating pathways that allow air and water to enter and leave the soil. Even microscopic fungi can help in this regard. The soil food web, then in addition to providing nutrients to roots in the rhizosphere, also helps create soil structure. Um, 
The activities of its members bind soil particles together even as they provide for the passage of air and water through the soil. Soil life produces soil nutrients. When any member of a soil food web dies, it becomes fodder for other members of the community. The nutrients in these bodies are passed on to other members of the community. A larger predator may eat them alive, or they may be decayed after they die. One way or the other, fungi and bacteria get involved. Be it decaying the organism directly, or working on the dung of the successful eater, it makes no difference. Nutrients are preserved and eventually are retained in the bodies of even the smallest fungi and bacteria. When these are in the rhizosphere, they release nutrients in plant available form when they, in turn, are consumed or die. Without this system, most important nutrients would drain from soil. Instead, they are retained in the bodies of soil life. Here is the gardener's truth. When you apply a chemical fertilizer, a tiny bit hits the rhizosphere, where it is, abs uh, where it is absorbed, but most of it continues to drain through soil until it hits the water table. Not so with the nutrients locked up inside soil organisms, a state known as immobilization. These nutrients are eventually re released as waste or mineralized. And when the plants themselves die and are allowed to decay, the nutrients they retained are again immobilized in the fungi and bacteria that consume them. The nutrient supply in the soil is influenced by soil life in other ways. For example, worms pull organic matter into the soil where it is shredded by beetles and the larvae of other insects, opening it up for fungal and bacterial decay. This worm activity provides yet more nutrients for the soil community. That's pretty cool. Um, oh my. So, like, it was explaining that, like, with uh, the use of, like, supplements, top feed, you are, like, feeding the plant, and it, like, pours and drains through, and the plant retains oh so much, but when you, like, go through the means of the um, microorganisms in the soil, the soil food web, um, the supplies are there, and it's something that's uh, present but only being used in those amounts when there's that activity. Um, they talked about the bacteria and the fungi being fertilizer bags, the arthropods, um, and the nematodes being the fertilizer spreader that would consume and spread that as they would consume the bacteria and fungi and poop it out once again, uh, spreading the nutrients that are within as well. Um, that's one of many means. Like we were talking about um, mycorrhizae fungi, mycorrhizae association, the relationship between root hairs and uh, the mycorrhizae fungi to produce the natural nitrogen. Um, it's, it's happening through, through the different means, the application of this nitrogen natru naturally. Um, we were talking about that earlier with the other means of like um, how I reduce the pH in my solution or reduce the pH um, in the in, or the soil reduces the pH through through the contents the citric acid the, uh, the limestones and stuff oh yes um, sorry get back to it healthy soil food web controls disease um, a healthy food web is one that is not being destroyed by pathogenic and disease-causing organisms. Not all, not all soil organisms are beneficial, after all. As gardeners, you know that pathogenic soil bacteria and fungi cause many plant diseases. Healthy soil food webs not only have tremendous numbers of individual organisms, but a great diversity of organisms. Uh, remember that teaspoon of good garden soil? Perhaps 20,000 to 30,000 different species make up its billion bacteria. Um, a healthy population in number and diversity. Um, a large and diverse community controls troublemakers. A good analogy 
is a thief in a crowded market. If there are enough people around, they will catch or even stop the thief, and it is in their self-interest to do so. If the market is deserted, however, the thief will be successful, just as he will be if he is, just as he will be if he is stronger, faster, or in some other way better adapted than those that would be in pursuit. In the soil food web world, the good guys don't usually catch thieves, though it happens. Witness the hapless nematode that started this all for us. Uh, rather, they compete with them for exudates and other nutrients, air, water, and even space. If the soil food web is a healthy one, this competition keeps the pathogens in check. They may even be outcompeted uh, to their death. Just as important, every member of the soil food web has its place in the soil community. Each, be it on the surface or subsurface, play a specific role. Elimination of even just one group can drastically alter a soil community. Birds participate by spreading protozoa carried on their feet or droppings of worm. Worm participate. Oh, wait, 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 wait. What the fuck? Sorry, some of these are, are hard to go and run off. Elimination of even just one group can drastically alter a soil community. Birds participate by spreading protozoa carried on their feet or dropping a worm taken from one area into another. Too many cats and things will change. Dung from, mammal provi Dung from mammals provides nutrients for beetles in the soil. Kill the mammals or eliminate their habitat or food source, which amounts to the same thing, and you won't have as many beetles. It works in the reverse as well. A healthy soil food web won't allow one set of members to get so strong as to destroy the web. If there are too many nematodes and protozoa, the bacteria and fungi on which they prey are in trouble, and ultimately, so are the plants in the surface. Um, so are the plants in the area. Um, and there are other benefits. The nets or web fungi form, uh, the web's fungi form around roots, act as physical barriers to invasion and protect plants from pathogenic fungi and bacteria. Uh, bacteria coats surface so thoroughly there is no room for others to attach themselves. If something impacts these fungi or bacteria and their numbers drop or they disappear, the plant can easily be attacked. Uh, special soil fungi, called mycorrhizal fungi, establishes themselves in a symbiotic relationship with roots, providing them not only with physical protection, but with nutrient delivery as well. In return for exudates, uh, these fungi provide water, phosphorus, and other plant nutrients. Uh, soil food web populations must be in balance, or these fungi are eaten and the plant suffers. Bacteria produces exudates of their own, and the slime they use to attach uh, surface attach to surfaces traps pathogens. Sorry, let me read that again. Uh, bacteria produces exudates of their own, and the slime they use to attach to surfaces traps pathogens. Sometimes, bacteria work in conjunction with fungi to form protective layers not only around roots in the rhizosphere, but on an equivalent area around leaf surfaces. The phylosphere. Uh, leaves produce exudates that attract microorganisms in exactly the same way roots do. These act as a barrier to invasion, uh, preventing disease-causing organisms from entering the plant system. Some fungi and bacteria produce inhibitory compounds. Things like vitamins and antibiotics, which help maintain or improve plant health. Penicillin and streptomycin, for example, are produced by a soil-borne fungus and a soil-borne bacterium, respectively. That was cool. Um, I gotta look more into that. I always, I always was like, mycorrhizae fungi. But it's also there protecting the plant and providing phosphorus. Mm -hmm. 
all nitrogen is not the same. Ultimately, from the plant's perspective anyhow, the role of the soil food web is to cycle down nutrients until they become temporarily immobilized in the bodies of bacteria and fungi, and then mineralized. Um, the most important uh, of these nutrients is nitrogen, the basic building block of amino acids and therefore life. The biomass of fungi and bacteria, that is the total amount of each in the soil, determines for, most, for the most part, the amount of nitrogen that is readily available for plant use. It wasn't until the 1980s that soil scientists could accurately measure the amount of bacteria and fungi in soils. Dr. Elaine Ingham at Oregon State University, along with other, others, started publishing research that showed the ratio of the, these two organisms in various types of soil. In general, the least disturbed soils, those that supported old, old growth timber, had far more fungi than bacteria, while disturbed soils, rototilled soil for example, had far more bacteria than fungi. These and latter studies show that agricultural soils have a fungal to, ba uh, fungal to bacterial biomass, uh, fungus to bacteria ratio of one to one or less while forest soils have 10 times or more fungi to bacteria. Um, 10 times or more fungi than bacteria. Like we I've been talking to you guys about how there's the, uh, the demand for um, fruit bearing crop versus um, trees. The old world forest has a hell of a lot more of the fungus than the bacteria and then stuff we're working with and what's in the farmland has more of an even ratio of them or more bacteria um, in, in comparison. Um, Ingham and some other graduate students at OSU also noticed a correlation between plants and their preference for soils that were fun uh, fungally dominated versus those that were bacterially dominated or neutral. Um, since the path from bacterial to fungal domination in soils follows in the general course of plant uh, secession, it, becomes, it became easy to predict what type of soil uh, particular plants preferred uh, by noting where they came from. In general, perennials, uh, trees, and shrubs preferred fungally dominated soils, while annuals grasses and vegetable preferred soils dominated by bacteria. Uh, sorry. Oh god, let me read that again. I totally botched that. Uh, in general, perennials, trees, and shrubs prefer fungally dominated soils, while annuals, grasses, and vegetables prefer soils dominated by bacteria. Um, one implication of these findings for the gardener has to do with the nitrogen in bacteria and fungi. Remember, this is what the soil food web means to a plant. When these organisms are eaten, some of the nitrogen is retained by the eater, but much of it is released as waste in the form of plant available ammonium, um, depending on the soil environment. This can either remain as ammonium or be converted into nitrate by spec, uh, special bacteria. When does this conversion occur? When ammonium is released in soils that are dominated by bacteria. This is because such, soil, uh, such soils generally have an alkaline pH, thanks to bacterial bioslime, uh, which encourages the nitrogen-fixing bacteria to thrive. The acids producing, uh, sorry, the acids produced by fungi as they begin to dominate, lower the pH and greatly reduce the amount of these bacteria. In fungally dominated soils, much of the nitrogen remains in ammonium form. Uh, ah, here is the rub. Chemical fertilizers provide plants with nitrogen, but, with, but most do so in the form of nitrates. An understanding of the soil food web makes it clear, however, that plants that prefer fungally dominated soils ultimately won't flourish on a diet of nitrates. 
<clears throat> Knowing this can make a great deal of difference in the way you manage your gardens and yard. If you can cause either fungi or bacteria to dominate, or provide an equal mix, and you can, just how in just how is explained in part two. Then plants can get the kind of nitrogen they prefer without chemicals and thrive. Okay. Uh, chemical fertilizers provide plants with nitrogen through the form of nitrates versus how the fungi um, what was it? Um, produces it through ammonium form bacteria. Um, converts it uh, from ammonium into uh, nitrate. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, it's always fun. Negative impacts on the soil food web. Chemical fertilizers, pesticides, insecticides, and fungicides affect the soil food web, toxic to some members, warding off others, and changing the environment. Important fungal and bacterial relationships don't form when a plant can get free nutrients. When chemically fed, plants bypass the microbial assisted method of obtaining nutrients and microbial populations adjust accordingly. Trouble is, you have to keep adding chemical fertilizers and using quote-unquote isides, pesticides, insecticides, fungicides, because the right mix and diversity, the very foundation of the soil food web, has been altered. It makes sense that once the bacteria, fungi, nematodes, and protozoa are gone, other members of the food web disappear as well. Earth web, earthworms, for, ex uh, for example, lacking food and irritated by the synthetic nitrates and soluble nitrogen fertilizers, move out, uh, since they are major shredders of organic material. Their absence is a great loss. Without the activity and diversity of a healthy food web, you not only impact the nutrient system, but all the other things a healthy soil food web brings. Um, soil structure deteriorates. Watering can become problematic. Pathogens and pests establish themselves. And worst of all, gardening becomes a lot more work than it needs to be. If the salt-based chemical fertilizer don't kill portions of the soil food web, rototilling will. This gardening ride of spring break, oh, sorry, this gardening ride of spring breaks of uh, fungal, uh, fungal hyphae. Gosh, I had to read that again. I'm sorry. This gardening ride, uh, uh, sorry, this gardening ride of spring breaks up fungal hyphae. Um, decimates worms, and rips and crushes arthropods. It destroys soil structure and eventually saps soil of necessary air. Again, this means more work for you in the end. Air pollution, pesticides, fungicides, and herbicides, too, kill off important members of the food web community or chase them away. Any chain is only as strong as its weakest link. If there is a gap in the soil food web, the system will break down and stop functioning properly. Mm -hmm. Healthy soil food webs benefit you and other plants. Why should a gardener be knowledgeable about how soil and soil food web helps work? Oh, sorry. Why did I just read? Why should a gardener be knowledgeable about how soils and soil food webs work? because then you can manage them so they work for you and your plants. By using techniques that employ soil food web science as your garden, uh, you can at least reduce and at best eliminate the need for fertilizers, herbicides, fungicides, and pesticides, and a lot of accompanying work. You can improve, you can improve degraded soils and return them to usefulness. 
Soils will retain, will retain nutrients in the bodies of soil food web organisms instead of letting them leach out uh, to God knows where. Your plants will be getting nutrients in the form uh, each particular plant wants and needs so they will be less stressed. You will have natural disease prevention, protection, and suppression. Your soils will hold more water. The organisms in the soil food web will do most of the work or maintaining plant health. Oh, sorry. I gotta get some water too. Ooh. I gotta reread this. Thank you for following along. Sorry if it's been slightly botched. I'm trying to read, read aloud, retain myself, and, and catch on with the longer sentences. Also stoned and had a beer. Regardless, thanks for being here. Oh boy. Let's go back to the beginning. Why should a gardener be knowledgeable about how soils and soil food webs work? because then you can manage them so they work for you and your plants. By using techniques that employ soil food web sciences, uh, sorry, by using techniques that employ soil food web science as your garden, you can at least reduce and at best eliminate the need for fertilizers, herbicides, fungicides, and pesticides, and a lot of accompanying work. You can improve degraded soils and return them to usefulness. Soils will retain nutrients in the bodies of soil food web organisms instead of letting them leach out to God knows where. Your plants will be getting nutrients in the form of uh, each particular plant wants and needs so they will be less stressed. You will have natural disease prevention, protection and suppression. Your soils will uh, hold more water. The organisms in the soil food web will do most of the work of maintaining plant health. Billions of living organisms will be continuously at work throughout the year, doing the heavy chores, providing nutrients for plants, building defense systems against pests and diseases, loosening soil and increasing drainage, providing necessary pathways for oxygen and carbon dioxide. You won't have to do these things yourself. Gardening with the soil food web is easy, but you must get the life back in your soils. First, however, you have to know something about the soil in which the soil food web operates. Second, you need to know what each of the key member of the food web community does, but these concerns are taken up in the rest of part one. Yeah, there it is. Chapter one.